Welcome to the Callus Town Hall. I'm David Sheets, the state curator, and we're going to be talking about the architecture of democracy, a talk, Temples of Democracy in Vermont. And town halls are certainly the basic structure that every town in Vermont enjoys, a structure that houses the New England derivative of what really is direct democracy in our communities throughout this state. Nothing more than town meeting itself is an institution that we cherish. It's been threatened in more recent years, but it's an institution that persists. And in many towns, there actually are, is a resurgence going on in terms of using old town halls um, and having town meeting mean something again in terms of bringing the community together to make the decisions that they need to make for yet another year of operations at town meeting. Town meeting, as it's practiced in Vermont, is a gathering of local citizens who cast their votes individually with discussion beforehand on all the matters that pertain to the town. How to spend their tax money, whether to buy a new fire truck or fix the old one, support the school budget, put a new furnace in the town hall, elect town officials, or pass a resolution that reflects the will of the majority of the town's voters. As such, it is a legislative body and the purest form of democracy whose roots go back to Athens in 400 BC. At least 6,000 citizens were required to achieve a quorum in Athens, but women and slaves were not able to vote. In town meeting governments, no elected representatives intervene between the citizen and what the government says or how it acts. In other words, no representatives, no ringers, no lobbyists, no party line discipline, no red tape or compromise. The individuals vote. The first town meeting to occur in New England occurred in Massachusetts in 1633, and in Vermont it was held in Bennington in 1762. And throughout Vermont since that year, town meetings have become the most direct democracy that any citizen exercises in their own governance their democratic governance. I live in Callis, so this town hall is actually my town hall. And it has been stuffed with people um, to overflowing in all of the years that I've lived here until the last five, when we finally had to admit that the building had to undergo a major renovation. And since that time, we've held our town meeting at the local elementary school. But our hope is, as we wrap up the renovation of this old town hall, that we will begin to use it again in the way that communities throughout Vermont have embraced their town halls. Um, they tend to look, in many cases, like churches. And this one actually was a condominium arrangement in 1866 when it was built as the home of the Christian church up here and downstairs the town hall. 
and it was built with that condominium arrangement from the outset. What happened to the Christian church is that it eventually faded away, and the town took over the entire building, although the Ladies' Home Mission continued to care for the building and in fact served the wonderful lunches that accompany any good town meeting. There's a certain feeling in a town hall in a, that is being used on town meeting day. The chairs are uncomfortable, the temperature too hot or cold, and it may be too crowded, but there's a real satisfaction in being in a room as the people of a town shape their own government. There's the opportunity to vote or express your views, to discuss opinions with neighbors in private or on the floor, to partake of a lunch, and to be part of the most important town gathering of the entire year. What I read uh, from the rostrum came from a wonderful book that Peter Miller put together that celebrates Vermont's gathering places. It's all about the communities that we so enjoy in this state. And the architecture of town halls has so much to do with putting people together in a common cause and simply being able to socialize. Now I say this at a time when town halls throughout the state and state houses are closed to the public because of the pandemic. And the socializing that we used to take so for granted and the ability to be with one another, whether it's to further the business of our community or simply to gather socially and have fun is in peril right now. But all of us believe that we are coming to a point when we will be able to regain what we have lost during these recent months. And I feel confident that town halls are maybe the first places that everyone will end up going as we uh, suffer from Zoom fatigue and are eager to get into the face-to-face -face encounters that we've all been used to. Town halls, like the State House itself in Montpelier, often take their inspiration from Grecian architecture. And there are many examples throughout the state that have restrained examples, for the most part, of the Greek revival that was the vocabulary, the architectural vocabulary for government buildings throughout the nation. We'll talk more about that at the State House, but the wonderful porticos that many town halls actually enjoy, um, as well as the towers, steeples, cupolas that cause them to be noticed above uh, any other structure in town is not an accident. This is where government takes place and consequently the authority, the majesty, if you will, of such structures is very intentional. It's all about envisioning that building as invested with the people's authority, shared among the community but manifest in the building itself. So here we are. We're in Montpelier now, the capital of Vermont. And just behind me, of course, is the State House. Um, a building, in this case, that was built in the middle of the 19th century to look as though it were a building from Renaissance Italy. And it was a little easier to see the Renaissance impact on the State House back then because its dome, perhaps its most prominent feature, coupled with that grand rotunda from the previous State House, um, 
those two features combined are what make this the monumental structure that architect Thomas Silloway originally wanted you to appreciate. The dome back then was clad in copper just as it is today, the same copper cladding on a wooden dome, but he wanted you to think that the dome was actually made of granite, just like the rest of the State House, berry granite, and that was achieved with sand paint. So they simply threw sand into the paint. It was a gray color rather than the white that we see today. And they stuccoed the exterior of the drum of the dome to look as though it were made of granite. Above the dome itself, the part that is today gilded, um, was the copper cladding that I mentioned, and they simply painted that red in imitation of the red tile roofs that one would find on a dome in Renaissance Italy, surmounted by a statue of agriculture. And the original wooden figure was carved uh, at the design of Larkin Goldsmith Mead, a very young but very promising sculptor from Brattleboro, Vermont, who took this on as one of his earliest major achievements in the late 1850s, before his career really took off. Architectural historian Henry Russell Hitchcock and William Seal wrote a landmark book in the 1970s that became the Bible for people like me, architectural historians henceforth who were trying to appreciate state capitals nationwide. And in that time, they wrote this book, Temples of Democracy was actually the title, and the Vermont State House is called out as one of the earlier forms where the Greek Revival was combined, in fact, with the Renaissance Revival, all of which, of course, go back to classical Greece and Rome in terms of their antecedents. The two people who took it from there in terms of developing state capital architecture were Thomas Jefferson, who was a huge fan of the architecture of ancient Greece and Rome, what he called the structures from antiquity, and Charles Bullfinch, who popularized domes being used on state capitol buildings. Together, these two people set the trend for all state capitals that would follow throughout the United States. And the Vermont State House is one of the earliest to take that classical dome, combine it with a Greek portico from the Temple of Theseus, right outside of Athens, Greece. Our portico is actually a copy of the gable end of that Greek temple right outside of Athens. Um, those two architects would popularize this notion and Thomas Silloway and many other architects of state capitals took, their, uh, took the response to that trend. Thomas Silloway, in fact, um, was following Amy Young, who was the architect of the second state house, the previous one that developed our, our portico. And it was Amy Young who took a tour of the New England capitals um, in Concord, which is an older building than ours, went down to Boston to see Charles Bullfinch's, um, and then went on to New Haven, Connecticut, where Ithiel Town had designed a, an incredibly uh, chaste example of the Greek revival. Came back to Montpelier and designed his with a low saucer-shaped Roman dome surmounting the Greek temple.
and it was a remarkably chaste and heralded building when it was completed here on State Street, which for the first time was taking the traffic of Montpelier in the 1830s and transferring it from nearby Court Street to this new broad avenue that they were laying out in Montpelier for the grandeur of the State House that was behind me. That building, however, went up in flames in 1857, completely destroyed by a catastrophic fire, leaving only the granite walls in its wake. And it was in the months of 1857, following the fire, that Thomas Silloway was brought up from Boston to begin to consult with Vermont legislators about what would replace it. There was a debate as to whether Montpelier should remain as the capital, but beyond that debate, they moved on quickly to the realization that the whole State House would have to be replaced, with the exception of the portico, which he then rebuilt and added a larger State House behind it, finished off in this newly popular Renaissance revival architecture, looking instead to Renaissance Italy, which of course looked back to ancient Greece and Rome for their inspiration back in the 15th and 16th centuries. We're on the portico of the State House, and the portico of the State House is that last vestige of Amy Young's Greek Revival State House from the 1830s. Behind me are these enormous granite columns with sections of granite laid upon sections and attenuating very briefly up to the top of the portico, which has this very impressive plaster ceiling that, like the drum of the dome, was painted with sand paint to give it the texture of granite and the look, and we still have that original plaster ceiling of sunken coffers, um, newly restored in recent years. But this is where we start to enter the State House, and everything behind the Greek portico is the Renaissance. And this State House is a lot more ornamental than its predecessor, which was the height of simplicity. Here we're met with doors that are made of wood, and yet they're painted to look like bronze, the way you would find them in Renaissance Italy. And everything on these doors is made of wood, and yet they're incredibly carved um, to look, in many cases, like the double sunk coffers of plaster that you will see inside the State House as well. All of this is about grandeur. And the most important thing about a state capital is that it symbolizes the architecture of ancient Greece and Rome, the birthplace of democracy. But the other thing to remember as we go through the State House now is that Renaissance florid look, the grandeur of it all. Think about mid-19th century Vermont. General stores, barns. These are the structures that we celebrate for the humble state of Vermont. But to have a state house this grand, used at first for a mere two weeks in the winter for that exercise, but like so many gathering places in Vermont, this too is a state house that is used for non-governmental purposes as well as the legislature, the governor, the even at a time, the Supreme Court, all three branches of government under one roof. When you enter the state house, you're entering this main lobby through those impressive Renaissance-inspired doors, made entirely of wood, 
that are painted to look like the bronze doors that one would find on a similar building in Renaissance Italy. And you see the grandeur of the State House for the first time with not Doric out on the portico, but the Ionic order of Greek architecture and adopted as well by the Romans. And these impressive four columns with a fifth and a sixth off to the right and the left were made of cast iron because in rebuilding the State House, they attempted to make it as fireproof as possible. And cast iron was a building technology that was now readily available in the 1850s for buildings such as this. So rather than create an interior of wood as the previous State House had been, this building is largely a building of masonry, granite walls on the outside, brick walls on the inside with the help of a lot of cast iron as well. The floor is a tessellated marble floor of Vermont marble. The black tiles are from Isle Lamotte near Lake Champlain and they feature these magnificent fossils. A very decided decision by the architect and others to imbue the State House with the ancient times when snails and other sea creatures um, were found in the Champlain Sea. The walls are white plaster, often left uncured and unpainted at first, and the woodwork is painted an ivory color. So the cast iron columns look just like the woodwork itself. The only thing that breaks up the whiteness and the ivory color are the doors, which are made of pine, plentiful in Vermont, but they didn't want them to look like pine, so they were grain painted to imitate the look of mahogany. Throughout this lobby, we begin to tell stories to our visitors here at the State House. And one of the stories that you see featured here are the presidents of the United States who come from Vermont. Calvin Coolidge to my right, Chester Arthur to my left. We have managed to restore the missing pieces throughout the lobby, um, such as drapes, but the plaster ceiling is indicative of the kinds of classical revival ceilings that one would find. Um, egg and dart molding in double sunk coffers. Behind me in this long hallway that is directly beneath the house chamber is a magnificent bust done by Larkin Goldsmith Mead, the great sculptor from Brattleboro, Vermont, who won the competition to do Lincoln's tomb in Springfield, Illinois. And we believe that he did this marble bust in his studio in Florence, Italy, uh, as in preparation for the magnificent bronze statue of Lincoln that is on the monument that he designed to Lincoln in his hometown. For the past two years, the curatorial task force has worked with my office to begin to look at the State House with fresh eyes and to understand what are the central stories that the building currently tells and should continue to tell, but what are the stories that will ensure that all Vermonters feel connected to this building. That has been our critical charge for the last couple years and happily in the last legislative session Senator Ruth Hardy introduced a bill that is now allowing us to hire a consultant to help us with the exercise of creating an entirely new interpretive plan for the State House. We have, in previous years, we've managed to find uh, storytelling that connects the Abenakis 
as Vermont's indigenous people to the State House in one stairway. And just this year, in 2020, to correspond with the centennial of the 19th Amendment, we installed women in the Vermont State House, um, which actively tells the story how women advocated for their suffrage as early as the beginning, uh, before the Civil War, um, in the case of Clarina Howard Nichols, and um, other advocates up until their ability to finally um, vote 100 years ago this year. Since that 100 year interval, we did a great deal of research on the women who have populated the State House as members of the House, members of the Senate, leaders of both bodies, um, to the point now where even the four committee chairs who control the money in the State House are now women. So women have achieved a great deal here, and this is about telling their story just right here in the State House um, in the greater context of women's rights. We're in Representatives Hall, which is the largest room in the State House by far, originally designed to hold a representative from every town in the state of Vermont, which by the 1960s meant that there were 246 members representing the individual towns in Vermont. In 1965, the legislature reapportioned itself, and today the representatives number only 150, and all of their chairs and desks, which for the most part are original to the building, were reconfigured. And that prompted a major renovation of the State House in the early 70s. It was not done with very much sensitivity to the State House itself. And consequently, a decade later, the Friends of the State House were formed. There were calls for curatorial management of the building, and um, we worked in the early 1980s to bring that about and to begin the restoration of this State House. But most of the original furniture is still in this room, as are the original gas lights. Um, a magnificent chandelier, for example, uh, in the center of the room, with allegorical figures on the, around its middle, um, commerce, prudence, eloquence, science. Those four allegories are paired with Hiram Power's famous statue, the Greek slave, a nude woman with chains dangling from her wrists. The Greek slave was something of a symbol for the abolition of slavery. And that, after all, was the hot political issue in Vermont, as it was throughout the country at the time the State House was built. So all of these chambers today look exactly the way they did <clears throat> in the middle of the 19th century, when Ryland Fletcher was the first governor to take this rostrum and address the General Assembly in 1859 when the State House was completed. So the carpet on the floor is a, a Renaissance revival inspired carpet. The moldings, the entablature, the pilasters um, all bring to mind the elegance of the Renaissance. And what is the Renaissance, of course? Uh, the reinterpretation of the architecture of ancient Greece and Rome. The classical places that inspired what by the 19th century they simply called antiquity or the, the antique, the Italian antique. And this room brings to mind 
a chamber that was used in 1859 for a mere two weeks of legislative activity. Two weeks out of the entire year devoted to legislating in this chamber. So this is a chamber that saw the traditional uses of any prominent building in a town in Montpelier. Once you have a state house, um, you use it, it turns out, in surprisingly similar ways to town halls. In other words, as community gathering places, whether it has to do with government or whether it has to do with simply community use. That's the great thing about this state house, is in my opinion, we have managed to bring back that community gathering place mode to the state house. Admittedly, not so much during the pandemic, when you see obtrusive things in the chamber that are not normally a part of its decor. We have the big screens on either side of the rostrum. We have um, TV monitors um, that are showing the remote way that Vermont's legislature has been meeting since the end of March. But it is the lawmaking process that goes on in this chamber. Presiding officer, the Speaker of the House, who stands at the rostrum behind me and makes many of the critical leadership decisions, including committee assignments and so on, that allow Vermont's legislature to use this chamber to debate the issues of the day and to make law for the state of Vermont. The Senate chamber is the smaller of the two bodies that make up Vermont's legislature. There are only 30 senators, and from the time the Senate was established in the 1830s, there have only been 30 senators. However, the number of senators who represent each county district tends to vary depending on the population of Vermont at a given time. And, but currently, they sit in these chairs um, according to the delegation that they represent here in the Senate. And the presiding officer is Vermont's Lieutenant Governor or the President Pro Tem of the Senate, two key leaders that make up the Committee on Committees, which does all of the work that the Speaker of the House does in the House in terms of assigning senators to committees and covering the same territory as all of the committees in the House. Now, there are only 30 of them, so they have to serve on at least two committees, a morning committee and, a, and an afternoon committee, in order to cover all of the territory that the House also covers in terms of looking at bills and determining whether they will become law for the state of Vermont. This chamber is a beautiful one, a much more intimate chamber than the House chamber. The red color scheme that has always been in the House gives way, in this case, to a green color scheme. And yet this chamber is almost entirely untampered with in terms of its overall preservation. Right now, this chamber not only looks exactly the way it did in 1859 with the original furniture, all of the original gas lights as well, including an elaborate gas chandelier by Cornelius and Baker that has a water theme with cherubs riding seahorses um, and figures of Neptune, the god of the sea, on the upper tier. All done in the Renaissance Revival style, the overall architectural style of the State House itself. So in here as well, 
we have the galleries and the pilasters. In this case, no pilasters, full-blown columns that are fluted with Corinthian capitals and Corinthian uh, entablature um, and the dentilated cornice. But unlike the D shape of the house chamber, this chamber enjoys a completely oval ceiling overhead that is concave and gives the grandeur that the chamber needs, but at the same time makes the room incredibly intimate. In here, debates that are used with microphones in the house chamber are uh, completely conversational in tone in this room and uh, very little seating for spectators compared to the house with lower and upper galleries and window seats providing the seating for visitors. If you're of a certain temperament and you feel that you want to be on display in the Senate chamber, you actually can march across the chamber and take a seat in one of these elegant sofas in the front. But you do have to know that the senators will be looking at you and probably wondering who exactly you are uh, to have chosen a seat like that in this grand chamber. The details that needed to be restored to this chamber besides the details of having all of the original furniture and gas lights are the things that inevitably wear out over time. The ephemeral carpets, drapes, upholstery, all of that is ever changing as the use of the State House has taken place over the past 160 years. So today, the carpet is a beautiful Renaissance revival inspired design, very geometric, but also very floral. Um, the drapes are full of a green velvet trimmed in all kinds of patisserie, uh, particularly the grand drape above the rostrum that has lots of tassels and fringe. Um, and is an exact replica of what was above the rostrum at the time the State House was enjoyed in the mid 19th century. The Executive Chamber is otherwise known as the Governor's Office. And from 1859 until the early 1970s, this was the only office that Vermont governors enjoyed. However, in 1971, the Pavilion Hotel was demolished and reconstructed as a state office building, preserving the exterior of that old hotel on a portion of the exterior. And the entire top floor of that building was given to the governor as the fifth floor. Um, Montpelier jargon for West Wing. This, however, is a working office. It is sometimes called the ceremonial office. However, it is very much a working office at the time that the legislature itself is working in the building, roughly from January to May of each year. But this room was the beginning of the full-scale restoration of the State House that took place back in the early 1980s. And we started with the plaster ceilings. Um, the ornate plaster ceilings on all of the rooms throughout the second floor of the State House. So this is an excellent example where much of the ornate plaster had already been removed and was restored to the chamber, including the openwork cornice of oak leaves and acorns. The chandelier is a replica, in this case, of the original. Um, happily, from photographs, we were able to determine that it was very similar to an existing gas chandelier in the Massachusetts State House. And we worked with the governor's office there to bring their chandelier down so that molds could be taken from it 
and the castings of cherubs and other features of this ornate chandelier could be replicated as a result. On the walls are portraits of Vermont governors, and some of the bigger and better portraits of governors are found in the chamber itself, including works by Thomas Waterman Wood, uh, Thomas Leclerc, and a magnificent marble bust of Erastus Fairbanks, one of the Civil War governors, one of the very first to serve in this chamber when it was completed. Um, his bust was done by the famous American artist John Quincy Adams Ward. Thank you for joining me. This has been a very quick tour of the State House and a quick tour as well of the Callis Town Hall. I'm glad you could join me at this time in our history when democracy is being celebrated in all kinds of ways. And it's the Vermont Humanities that bring us these remarkable programs throughout the fall. I hope you'll go to the website to see the many offerings that follow this one um, on their website, vermonthumanities.org. Thank you.